to start out thanking the Iowa City Government Channel for filming these lectures and then making them available for later viewing, either on your cable television or on the internet. I don't even want to look up the date when I first met Judy, but I, I was thinking it might have been 1979 or something like that. Uh, but she came and discovered that we have some incredible diaries in our collection. Uh, there was a woman named Sarah Huftelin who was an educator out who was very interested in preserving her own story. And in 1947, she wrote a palimpsest article about school books that were used in one-room schools in Iowa. But probably her more crowning achievement is the work that she did with her mother's diaries. And I invite you to come up here later today to examine what we've got here, and Judy will explain the story of how this unfolds. But it's a 30-year diary run of a woman who comes to Iowa to live at her, her uncle's stagecoach inn and ends up becoming a farm wife and involved in literary groups in her area of Delaware County. Uh, there's been a lot of different studies about her. As a matter of fact, scholars have looked at her to study the barter economy in rural areas, to look at phrenology, mental illness and domestic abuse, death and the process of dying as you age. They've looked at courtship in the 19th century, rural education, and of course women's roles on the farms. So we have used this in exhibits, we've used it in our children's magazine. It is a perennial favorite. What we've laid out here today is a hair wreath that Emily made, and again, I want you to come up and take some time to study that because it has the hair of her family members woven into flower shapes, but she even includes the hair of their dog, Carlos. So uh, we have a few other things like a quilt and some little pieces of china that sat around the house. We have a scrapbook she made for her daughter. It's really a wonderful collection, and I'm glad Judy is here today to, to tell you a little bit about it. But I don't want it. Uh, uh, mislead you in any way because Judy's lecture is really about all of the different forays that she's made into women's diaries and she's traveled to New Zealand, Ireland and various places to track these stories down because it gives us a window into women's lives that we would not otherwise have. I think one thing I just thought I'd pass this around for fun but how do you begin to tackle 30 years of diaries? Well, as an instructor in the American Studies Department, Judy had her students each read a volume or a few months of the diary. And these are the worksheets they created that help us understand that barter economy and all the handwork and sewing and butter and eggs and the ways that Emily was trying to bring money into her household, partly because her husband was not exactly the most successful farmer. So I just wanted to give this a pass around so you can see how students begin to introduce themselves to primary source materials and then how that evolves when a seasoned scholar like Judy is around to tell that story. Uh, Judy, as I mentioned, was a graduate student in American Studies at the University of Iowa where she earned her PhD in 1987. She went on to an illustrious career at the University of Arizona from the 1980s until her recent retirement in 2017. She taught women's literature and life writing, all of that being derived from her first attempt to understand a person's life through their own writings, through their own narrative. So join me in welcoming Judy to our today's talk. was really kind. When I used to walk in and ask for another volume of the diary, you could just see Mary go, ah, it's her again. <laughs> that was very kind. So I'm going to take you on kind of a whirlwind tour of the world that I have discovered through diaries. And my Iowa story begins just across the west coast of Iowa in Omaha, Nebraska. I was raised there, but every summer we would go to my great aunt's farm, and they had been ranchers in the panhandle, and no longer had horses, but they would throw the saddles on saw horses, and we would pretend that we were pioneer women. Uh, also, because I was in Nebraska, our high school required reading was Will Like Heather. Nebraska has an author, and you're going to read her. Uh, <laughs> my Antonia was the one they chose which was about young people, but from a nostalgic point of view. And we hated it. We called her Wilma Catheter. We just, we just had no nostalgia. So after high school, I went east to college. I went to Ames, okay, where I was in the pre-veterinary studies program. But I married in the end of my sophomore year, ended up living in New York City's Times Square, going to Barnard, and then later living in New Haven and doing research at the Yale Medical School. And in those two places, they mocked me for my slow speech, for my vocabulary, and they insisted that Ohio, and I would say Iowa, and they'd say Ohio, 
has no, no history like the East. So by the time I came back here in 1969 to finish my undergraduate degree, I called myself a militant Midwesterner. I was going to be proud. I reread Cather. She sang to me. I read everything. I read Best Reader Aldrich's A Lantern in Her Hand. But for those of you who like Aldrich, if you read Spring Comes On Forever, it is her most marvelous book. It has brought many people to tears. So those things made me want to study pioneer women. Uh, I think Wayne Franklin helped me with an independent study that another woman and I did called Pioneer Women's Narratives. And we read books that were published by usually the wives of prominent people, the mayor's wife, some esteemed person's wife. And so they were all success stories. And I wondered about, what about the people who weren't successful? Also, they had these gaps that drove me crazy. They would say, I then suffered my fifth marriage, or sorry, miscarriage, not marriage, <laughs> miscarriage uh, in Indian territory. But I will not blot my narrative with that sadness. And I wanted, I wanted to know the sadness. So uh, in 1977, after a year living in Tucson, Arizona, I decided to come back to Iowa City to pursue a PhD in American Studies and Women's Studies. And I remember the phone call I received from the head of American Studies then. And he said, they've unanimously accepted you, but God knows why in the world you'd want to study women's diaries. So that, that's how I came back. And I was preparing in a couple of years a graduate course called Pioneer Women. So I walked into the downstairs here and said to my eternal happiness or regret, do you have any real diaries? And I was a beneficiary of Andrea Hinding, who had written to every archive because she was compiling an index of what holdings they had about women. And so, of course, the archivist here said, oh, we do have a 30-year-long diary that no one has ever read. Ooh. Hooked. <laughs> here is a picture of the first diarist I studied. This is Emily Hawley, age 20, living in Michigan. And she was a young woman of promise. She had boyfriends. She had educational aspirations. And she wrote things in her diary like, mother says, here you are 20 years old and not married yet. That made me angry. So I began to like her. I loved her voice. Let me show you some of her handwriting. I can actually still read this. This is when she would have been 47. By now, she was using beautiful headings. She was using better and better books because she really was a lifelong diarist. So it says, in the past year, trials and sorrows has been our lot to bear, ours to bear. Can you read it? Right. Um, the student worksheets that Mary's passing around exist no more. Most of my students cannot read cursive. So it's over. They cannot read it. And I should have noticed in worksheets, my students were saying, this is so hard to read. I don't understand this. This is so difficult that I, I knew that this was over. So as Mary said, I was intrigued by the diary, but I hadn't read all of it. So have your students do it. Each read two years of the diary. We all got together with the head of American Studies, and we went through Emily's life. Here is a picture, or a picture of her diary three years later. She had now probably had mild strokes. She had, she had such bad edema that she said her legs were swollen, and when she would push her finger in, the dent would, would stay there. So she was really miserable and said that this was the result of working so hard on the farm for a rather unloving, perhaps brutal, he was at least brutal to the horses, husbands. And students, as they read the earlier diary, had noticed uh, a code in it. And I think we, we did one of the pages that we have here with a code. On really boring days, young Emily Hawley wrote three exclamation marks, sold eggs, really? 
it was my students who said, have you noticed the marks are every 28 days? So she was recording her reproductive cycle. And after she had two children, those dots stopped, which I think means perhaps she and her husband were not <coughs> marital anymore. Anyway, she was really uh, a suffering martyr. The students said, oh, how she suffered. She gave everything for her children, her wonderful children, except for one male student, the dissenter, who said, these children are too perfect. I've been a little kid. Something is wrong with this diary. OK, so that should have been the hint. In 1981, without my dissertation done, uh, I joined the administrative faculty at the University of Arizona and took along Emily Holly Gillespie's diary on microfilm. So every night with my portable microfilm reader, I would look at it. And when you kept reading it, she was a complainer. It was very much a one-sided story. Eventually, I would learn that no diary is true. It can be authentic. But as we tell the stories of our lives, and she wanted to be a hero. She wanted to be the martyr who had given everything for her life. So I'm not sure I would have finished <coughs> Emily except for two things. Linda Kerber gave, gave me a nudge. <laughs> She, we were sitting at a railroad track in Tucson, Arizona. She'd come to give some guest lectures, and she said, if you don't finish that dissertation, I'm going to lead someone else to that diary. All right, and the other nudge was from Charles Bowden. Charles Bowden was the most masculist writer I've ever seen. He was an Ed Abbey devotee walked, did all kinds of borderlands thing, but his secret was he had studied women's history. It was constant. And he said, darn it, Judy, of course she was a bitch. Any totally alive woman in the 19th century would have been miserable. Write about what made her that way. And I went, I don't have to like her. I can just explain her life. So I defended my dissertation at the territorial building in 1987, and two years later, the book came out. And it was called A Secret to be Buried, with two R's, okay, from this passage, 1886. The heart sometimes is broken by trouble, and its possessor dies a martyr. I tried so hard to live through it without it being known by the outside world, suffered untold sorrow by bearing his abusive language, yet I did not dare displease him. I have written many things in my journal, but the worst is a secret to be buried when I shall cease to be. So when Linda said, I'm going to show other people the diary, I always went, oh, they'll find the secret. <laughs> I, I haven't found it, they'll go, oh, here it is. So of course, I got done. Now, about 12 years after the book was published, I got a call out of the blue from a man named Lee Baker, and he said, I think I'm related to the Gillespie family, and you know and I know that a nephew has some original diaries. I'm going to try to get them. My request had been unsuccessful, but here was a family person. I had moved on to other projects. I so did not want to sit in the dark with Emily Gillespie again, <laughs> but I wanted to look at these new diary findings. And I discovered that the wonderful diary I had loved of a youthful woman was probably a little bit altered. On the left is what Lee brought to us. This is what Emily wrote. Knit on crochet collar, wrote Lizzie Hamlin, blah, blah, blah. Looks like a boring diary. Here is the recopied diary that Sarah gave to the Historical Society. Notice that she is first, knit on the collar, and do housework. Wrote Libby Hamlin a letter, am all alone. Father and mother, no more ma, no more ma. Okay, at Uncle Ben's, everyone else. And then she goes back to herself. I am writing and meditating. Isn't that elevated? I do hope Sylvanus will marry his cousin Libby and not ask me for my company anymore because I do not want to trifle with him. He is too dear a friend. I cannot marry. Sounds like Jane Eyre, which she <laughs> had been reading. And so I had been fooled. So it took me quite a while to 
recover from being fooled. I had tenure, whew, wrote a couple of articles about this, and people said, you've been duped. She was horrible. But here is my understanding. She was in her late 40s when she was writing this on a porch of her house where everything was contentious. She was a Victorian woman who could not imagine a future, so she reinvented her past. The thing that most bothered me was she invented seven different suitors that she could have loved, but she did not. And that was part of the wronged women accounts of that era in which you marry the wrong person and your life is ruined. So she invented all of these men. So I have come to understanding of her. Well, my next project took me to Colorado. I had heard a lecture in a history course here about the beautiful baby doe Tabor. Wonderful legend, way too simple. So to make it short, she was born in the 1850s in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Lizzie McCourt. She had the bravery to marry the Protestant son of the mayor. And what do you do when your family embarrasses you? Send them west. So they went to Colorado to work on a family mine, but it was already played out. The husband was named Harvey Doe. And because of her beauty, they started calling her Baby Doe. Well, Harvey, the second winter, went home to mother in Wisconsin, leaving his wife, who bore a stillborn child. And so she ended up going with a Jewish merchant up to Leadville, Colorado, where she met the richest man in the state who was 25 years older than she was and married. And the love story began. And unlike other wealthy men who had a lover in the mining camps and their wives down in Denver, Horace Tabor wanted to marry his Lizzie. They married in Washington, DC. Chester A. Arthur was at the ceremony, not one wife. And that was the shunning that she would receive when they moved back to Denver. But their joy was that they had two daughters, Lily, then a stillborn son, and then a daughter they named Rosemary Echo Silver Dollar Tabor. There's trouble. <laughs> All right. And basically, uh, everything went OK, although it turns out that Horace lost his millions because his first wife, Augusta, was the thinker. Horace was not. So by the time he suddenly died in 1899, she was left with two young daughters and no money. And according to the legend, Horace said, hold on to the matchless mine in Leadville. It will make you rich again. So she did go there. The mine no longer actually was owned by them. And she lived in a tiny, tiny shack, uh, a third the size of this room, through the Leadville winters. and died in 1935 after all those years of isolation, her heart broken because the eldest daughter moved away and said she was not a Tabor. And the younger daughter, Silver, tried to be an actress, an author, and died horribly in Chicago. The press dunned Baby Doe about her daughter. So she was a beautiful woman who sinned and became the subtitle of my book, The Mad Woman in the Cabin. She wore huge shoes. She wore an enormous crucifix. She wore miners' clothes because she was trying to protect her matchless mind. I argued when I discovered her thousands of dreams and visions that rather than being a floozy, she was a warrior mother. She was devoutly Catholic. And she tried to tell the world, carefully dated, so it's kind of like a dream diary of the things that she explored. She was no artist, but this is a vision, not a dream. OK, so that's, that's different in one's recording and religious life. But she was very close to the Virgin Mary. And what I discovered is through these dreams and visions, she basically took her daughter, Silver, and changed her from a troublesome teen and a girl who ran from her mother to the dream child. There was one challenge. It's possible that Silver had a child and that that child was either the birth was terminated or I am thinking 
that Silver went to the Crittenden home, had the child, and it was given out. Baby Doe also used a code. Hers was that an A was a one, an E was a two, an I was a three. So up above it says 20th baby silver. And she would throw in a number for some of her consonants in her vowels. But we became very adept to reading the code. Some of it, uh, we'd go, oh, this is going to be so exciting sexual. And it would be, began the change today. <laughs> but it was very important to her. I think this may say that on one of these dates, something happened with her daughter, Silver, who even the priest had said, Silver is a way, in a way that she should be married. And the linchpin to me is this name of Fance, because Teresa Fance was a female doctor who worked at the Crittenden home, and, the, and Baby Doe knew her. And at one point later, after this whole event of the year, uh, Baby Doe wrote, uh, Therese, no, Teresa France wrote to Baby Doe and said, I saw your daughter on the street. She pretended not to know me, as many of the girls do. So actually, uh, a person is going to start looking next year. A lot of the birth records have opened up. I tried to find her. I couldn't find them through public records. Those were not accessible to me as a non-family member. I did work with a wonderful nun with the church baptismal archives, and I had brought a long list of the, the false names that Silver used when she was in trouble. We couldn't find anything. And then with her sterling blue eyes, the nun turned to me and said, let's try the name Tabor. <laughs> That's really good. But, but nothing was there. So all of these thousands of dreams and visions. So basically, for me, this revised Baby Doe from being a floozy who suffered to a woman who was far less interested in Horace loved her daughters and became the warrior mother in her dreams and visions, many of which were destroyed because she named names of prominent people that were associated with silver. Well, that baby doe work was interrupted for a while by a wonderful opportunity. I became a Fulbright scholar to New Zealand. Oh, why in the world would you study diaries? I was like, yes, all right. And my Diary research was called Our Natives, and I was going to compare a worst case scenario, the Whitman Massacre in the US, with missionaries, Christian missionaries to the Maori in New Zealand. And here was my theory. Would the women who were closer to indigenous people and women in particular in their homes have greater empathy and understanding? And the genesis of this was that after the Whitman Massacre in 1848, several of the Native Americans said they particularly hated Narcissa Whitman because she would not let us pass the threshold of her house. And so I thought this would be interesting. Well, this was not baby doe. These are some pretty stern pioneers. So Mary Walker wanted to be a missionary herself, but that was not a role a single woman could do. But there was this man named Elkanah, and he wanted to be a missionary. And so it was kind of an arranged marriage. And off they headed toward the Spokane area in 1833 of Washington. Of Washington. And to, um, she wrote in her diary that she began on this trip, should my life be spared, I may have the opportunity of comparing myself with myself. I just love that passage. Well, there were a couple of problems. They were still working out marital issues. The paper was very short. Paper was very dear in those times. And so her writing got smaller and smaller. She had a tiff with her husband and said, I hope he reads this journal to see how I feel. He didn't. There was another scholar at the Huntington who said, oh no, Elkanah Walker wasn't married. I'm reading his diary. I said, he was. She said, oh, he wasn't. And three days later, she said, his diary says, cross the river, wife and baggage follow. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I told you he was married. Uh, and she had uh, a child in uh, 
the mission. And due to health issues, uh, a Native American woman nursed the child and she said, oh, a black breast, but I shall hope this would happen. And she uh, loved that her son would play, but she did not want to love him too much. Hold that thought. So then I went to New Zealand and began reading the diaries of Jane and Mary Ann Williams from the 1820s. These are like the founding Pakeha families of New Zealand. Jane wrote, our hearts were cheered by hearing the boat's crew as we arrived sing a hymn most sweetly in their native language. Later that night she wrote, the tall and muscular forms of the New Zealanders flitted before my mind's eye. Well, fool me once. This was too eloquent of a diary, and we discovered in the notes that these were circulating journals to be sent back to England to their funding agency. And so everything was wonderful. So I quickly converted to a Methodist woman, Eliza White. And you can see in her diary, with my notes, this is just a Xerox I didn't write in the real diary, uh, that she wants somebody to notice this. Now this is much harder for me to read, but it looked to me like in the bottom that, quote, the natives had um, misbehaved and she was unhappy. Uh, she had had three miscarriages, and then one of her children, a son, William, lived for eight months and died. And missionaries on both sides of this comparison felt that this was a punishment. After his death, she wrote, Oh, how I feel so severe a stroke was needful to bring my wandering heart to stay itself on God. And she was avoided by the other missionary women because they felt that a child death meant you weren't devout enough. The most touching part of this was that she went to the deathbed of a Maori man and said, when you go to heaven, will you find my little son William and tell him that I love him. So she envisioned a heaven in which all people were, and her, this, that was, that was my, my saddest situation. So I wrote an article for that. Back now, 2004, in Arizona, I was going to teach a graduate course on Western women's journals. So I went to the Arizona Historical Society and said, do you have any real diaries? And uh, I, again, was the beneficiary of 1980s work by the historian Sandra Myers, who had come there for a conference that we organized, went to the Historical Society to look for women's journals, and they said, well, you'll just have to look under the collections and see if they're under men. Oh, if you knew Sandra, that was not a good answer. So by the time I walked in, they did know of quite a few women's journals, and they had found a journal that was given to them in 1964 with the, uh, it had been sealed, but now they felt enough time had passed that they should read it. And so I was introduced to the diary of Irish immigrant Mary Ellen Murphy Welsh, who was called Mim. And the diary was from 1913 to 1964. 51? years. Anyway, and again, my research took me around the world to Ireland. I've made two trips. I was hooked by her diary of the first year that began on her wedding day. There was already a thin scattering of people, but I was semi-conscious and recognized none of them. I knelt and said a perfunctory prayer, incredibly my last prayer as a single woman. It tailed off into some lines from one of the sonnets from the Portuguese, never alone upon the threshold of my door of individual life shall I command the uses of my soul. Too eloquent. <laughs> Too eloquent, all right? So the, the diary of the first year was on single paper. And here you can see the aberrant page that is clearly re it's not funny, Karen. <laughs> Clearly reconstructed. And you see the page ahead of it has crossing out. But the, the prose actually follows. So you can't tell what was cut out. Uh, many diaries have passages cut out of them where a person doesn't want to destroy her book, but she needs to destroy 
something that she said. Uh, we later find in the middle of Mim's 51-year diary that because she was an aspiring fiction writer, maybe she tried for publication. So she was actually a career woman who had moved from Longford County, Ireland, to London to work for the British Accounting Office that came back to help her mother in her dying days. Then she went to Dublin and worked in the General Post Office, which became very famous. And we don't know how she met Patty Welsh. She was four years older than he was. We don't know if he ever found out. We do have a few of their courtship negotiation letters in which she says, I'm an accountant. I am not a housekeeper. And he says, oh, we'll be living with my widowed father, and he has a housekeeper. Do not mind. Within a month, the housekeeper <laughs> resigned. And there she was, <laughs> stuck with her father-in-law. So two years later, when Patty was diagnosed with tuberculosis and told to clear out for California, I wonder if she was actually relieved. Here is a picture of them when they left. Uh, she, she looks so much older than an earlier picture we have of her. Living in the house of her father-in-law for two years must have done it. Uh, they immigrated in late 1915. If someone wants to ask a question of how he could do that with tuberculosis, it's interesting. First they tried Los Angeles. That did not pan out because it was dank and no jobs, but there was a lot going in Bisbee, Arizona during the Great War. That's a copper mining town. It's in rural southeast Arizona, but they had to get there through Tucson on a train. So here's what she wrote. Got to Tucson, very hot, sleepy, dusty town, men lying asleep on alleged grass, crowds of Mexicans everywhere. Past Indian encampment near Tucson, also several real live cowboys. After that, desert, broken at long intervals by so-called towns, some of which consist of only one house and a tent. So this was the type of life that she lived. They uh, made a successful life, but it was challenged by Patty's drinking, by perhaps an affair, uh, by deaths in their families that wrote from Ireland, by their tremendous worry over Ireland after the Easter Rising and during the Civil War. And so I think she was always uneasy in America. Here is a code that she deployed in her diary. And it first I went, aha, every 28 days, no. <laughs> it was not. And uh, sometimes there's only one of these marks, sometimes three. Uh, they continued into her 70s. So I, I think it actually might have been Patty's drinking, or it looks like an arcane accounting mark that said, see something later. But uh, the diary is written, the early diary in pencil, and it's very hard to tell. But all the diaries I have studied have coded because I think many of them envision their book being read by, by someone. All right. Once you finish one volume, Thomas Mallon says, you say book, who, who might read it? So we get to that area. Uh, Patty became a CPA. And this is a classic pose of the woman admiring the man, although she was the reader. She has on her Irish collar. She did try to be a professional writer. Only one thing was published. And oh, it just so bothers me. She uh, was called hostess in her obituary. Mary Welsh, hostess, which I think would have very much hurt her. So I was interested in how Mim has remained Irish in America, how she coped with his drinking, and how she coped when they finally, in 1950, so they're now in their 60s, go back to Ireland. Everything was changed. Most of the people they loved had died. She meets her sister Rose, and Rose says, look at you, a fat yank, broad nose. What happened to you? And Mim wrote in her diary, she likes something out of the French Revolution. <laughs> All right, so it did not go well. They actually had to come back to America early because of the drink and the dank. They mostly were sleeping separately by that time, but not in these little hotel rooms. 
And when Mim would write in her diary, Patty coughed all night. She knows that because she's lying awake next to him as he coughed all night. So they actually came back to America on the Irish Oak on a sailing about a year later than Frank McCourt, Evangelist Ashes. So there's all wonderful connections that I like. Well, although he was sick all of his life and she pulled Patty through everything, he finally did die in 1963 very suddenly. She stopped her diary only making notes of visitors, cards received, a very sad ritual. But she was a lifelong diarist. And so she began to write him letters with this tiny handwriting on his office stationery, including the inside address. And it's, they're really very touching. She says, in all our 50 years of marriage, I never wrote to you. We were always together. In fact, we only have one picture of her alone. And that was her passport picture from 1950. And she looks shocked. They were always, always side by side. And so she writes about her love for him, et cetera. Uh, she became more Western. She had, because she did not drive, she had to rely on rides from Mexican boys to an Irish barrio church that a priest ran. And so she became much more, more tolerant. Uh, she loved music, but she was having trouble with her widow, widowhood. So let me read you about her going to a guitar concert. She wrote to Patty, the guitar itself had a doleful effect on me. I remembered how much you loved yours at first and how later seemed to lose interest in it and seldom played it. And I accused myself of being the cause of this. I was, wasn't I? And did I do you this disservice in many other ways? I cried bitterly for hours, all night indeed. I saw myself as a destroyer of your pleasure in many things. After this confession, Mim closed that letter with, good night, my dear, your miserable, miserable failure of a wife who always loved you. Now you are sighing. My students who read this, again young, and everybody's reading two years, said, what? What happened to her brain? Why is she writing these kind things about him? So I had assumed I would zip through these letters. They're the most beautiful record of mourning, touching record of mourning that, that I can imagine. So let me leave you with a happier uh, thought about her love of music. Uh, she was finally cajoled by Gilbert Ronstadt to go to a concert of his children. She didn't want to leave the house, but he cajoled her. She came back and wrote to Patty, Linda, whom you and I saw when she wandered out of bed and into a party when she was two, is a stunning brunette with flashing dark eyes and the charm of her paternal inheritance. So Gilbert took her home and she taught him, I knew me love by his way of walking, and he went home whistling it. When I sent that to Peter Ronstadt, the, the older brother, he just cried and cried about how his father learned an Irish tune in the West. Uh, the working title of this swan song book is Shamrock in the Desert, okay? Because um, I am interested in remaining Irish, sometimes stereotypically. And I call it that title because in 1916, in Bisbee, in March, they got a box that was supposed to contain shamrock from Ireland. And they opened it up and it was dust. And so she felt that that was true. And then when they hosted riotous St. Patrick's Day parties later, people would always bring them shamrock. Patty was buried at Holy Hope Cemetery, which was pretty bereft of sun in those days in Arizona. And she would write to Patty that she had put alleged shamrock on his grave. So I argued that they have become alleged kind of US citizens. But wait, this is Iowa stories. Back to the Iowa story. All right. This is Emily's mature picture. And she wrote January 1876. Tis the beginning of the centennial year. 
being just 100 years since independence was declared to the United States. In Philadelphia has been arranged a place for a centennial celebration in which all nations are to be represented. Would that we might join with them, but we can only wish them our best wishes for success. So there she was in that Iowa farmhouse. So what would be the odds that in 2002, because I was the president of the Western Lit Association, I was invited by Laura Bush to come to the White House and to join a conference on women in the West. And as I was waiting to enter the East Room, someone came up to me and said, aren't you the person who published Emily Gillespie's diary? So that her name was mentioned in the White House all, over 200 years later. I, I just thought it was amazing. And that is why in the world I study diaries. It is. It's very difficult. And I was very guilty of over transcribing in the case of MIM. Uh, the staff was going through a lot of turnover, and I so feared that our collections were going to be swept up to Phoenix. And so I, I just transcribed as quickly as I could. And then when I hit those letters, oh, I was just, my heart was stopped in its tracks. So I did read the entirety. I took notes, I have a lot of question marks, and the uh, secondary research is just fascinating it's into so what I've found. So it's been a slow process. So far from 1913, I'm up to 1957, I can do this, okay, with the draft of, of the book. But it's a really good question. So with Emily, I chose themes of domesticity and how she both involved it, used it, deployed it on behalf of her children and was kind of a victim of it. With Mim, it is this theme of being Irish in America. How she's, they're, they're brought out. Um, they were peripheral. Her husband first worked for the university and then became an independent CPA. And they met lots of faculty and they were very literary. So they would be brought out if uh, Oliver John, St. John Gogarty were being there, if another great writer would be there, the Dublin Players. But then other times they would be excluded and they would actually drive around in the car and see whose cars were parked in front of a party to know who was there and not. And she gets involved in the reciprocity. Unfortunately, what most people have gotten from the diary so far is that these people drank. All the faculty drank. They would aim their cars toward Nogales, especially during Prohibition, drive into ditches coming back, uh, Patty eventually got a DUI in 1946. The joke cards that are in the collection, oh, you beat the police, oh, get out of the ditch and drink again. It's absolutely um, amazing. I have a senior faculty member reading it with me, and he's just going, I didn't go to these parties. <laughs> what happened? So it's this culture of inebriation. I love, after, after Patty is released from the DUI. He says, we're never drinking again. And she says, I think this may be too bold. <laughs> and a, six weeks later, she says, came home from the party early. These are not nearly as amusing when one is not drinking. <laughs> so it, it was a challenge. But they had a wonderful marriage. What, what is breaking my heart now is to see how she calls work just barely trying to get the housework done. She's beginning to fall more now and things, versus work being trying to get something published. And one of her friends was Rosemary Drackman Taylor, who wrote several books who were made it, which were made into two films. And you can just see Mim going, why her and not me? Uh, I was able to talk to her, Mim's beloved Irish priest, and he gave me materials. And here's why I keep working at it. 
We met twice, and then out of nowhere, he says, by happy accident, I have found a speech that Mim gave. So this is like 2010. The speech was given in 1921. Somehow this priest got it in the 1950s, and it's marvelous about we Irish who are breaking our hearts, and I'm going to give you the poetry of Patrick Pierce. I'm not giving you the poetry of Oscar Wilde. <laughs> so she was very bold. Uh, one person who knew her does not like the diary, because on the outside, she was fun at parties, very laughable. She was a wonderful hostess. And then she would do the post-mortem in her diary. And one more aside on that. Um, I've had three people tell me how much the, she loved their children, and one of them was a young girl who used to go to her house and read there. Oh, I just love Mrs. Boyle. She was wonderful, the diary. At last, the hellions are gone. <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot stand them. So first I go, first I went, I probably did that to my great aunt. <laughs> she probably, number two, what a hypocrite. And then I went, how gracious that these people remembered her fondly and said how much she loved children. And what a relief. You call that a compensatory diary where you go, oh, and write it out. <laughs> Uh, I don't have a question, but I have a comment, and it relates to your talking about how a diary shows one or more sides of a diary writer, but not all sides. And it's a personal example. So some years ago, um, I was involved in something on, on women's diaries, and I thought, well, I'll look at my own diaries from high school. <laughs> and I remembered my high school years as I get home, I do homework, I fall asleep, I wake up, I do more homework. I was just totally, totally burdened by homework. What a hard working student I was. So then I looked at my high school diaries, which showed a different side. All I wrote about was boyfriends. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, in mine it was horses and boys. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, but that could be the excuse for Emily, who was leaving these diaries to her daughter, to say, your mother didn't have bad grammar, and uh, your mother was very popular. <laughs> Did I mention I was elevated? And we think she took out, so they were really banal, kind of passionate poems, and she put in these insipid, you know, work harder and be a good person. <laughs> so we do, re don't we remember yeah. our childhoods differently? Yes, we do. So I'm going to go back to my childhood diary, which said like two things, and it was like fed chickens. <laughs> fed chickens. <laughs> oh, how beautiful. Question. So when you, when you start to uh, get into the diary, do you mm -hmm. find that fairly quickly some sort of theme emerges in your mind about what's going on, or, or do, you, do you caution yourself to not put anything on it until you're all the way through? I'm just curious about how that works. I think with Emily that might have been true, that I let it emerge. And I actually did some rudimentary content analysis to find out what she was mentioning. I think I did every June throughout, because it was an agricultural cycle, every June throughout the 30 years. And I found that she started having stronger and stronger opinions. And then the children were perfect. And then James went down. So I tried to do that to kind of test myself. Uh, with, with Mim, uh, the Irish diary, she will actually say, see back this diary, see this page, etc." She clearly anticipated readers. It is not perfectly clear. They don't have records of how that diary got there. Very late in life as a widow, she got one of those ads from Vantage Press, publish your book, for, and she thought she might try it. And then she found out you had to pay them to publish your book. But she also was reading passages of it to the director of the Historical Society, who was a dear friend. And thank goodness when India got those diaries, because Mim said they'll be very interesting. And Mim opened them up and saw prestigious people's names in unflattering things and went, at least she didn't destroy them. At least she said, we'll just seal these for later time. So that was a real, a real gift. But in her case, I think those De definers, Irish, etc. And by 
exploiting my students, sorry, Reed, <laughs> by, by exploiting students, uh, you can have them go the overview and have them tell what themes come out. Like, how, uh, what does the diarist think of herself? Uh, if you use three adjectives, what would it be? And a hard working often comes up. What would be the adjectives that they would describe? I also have students in that journalist class uh, write their own journal every day. Unbeknownst to them, they're going to do a worksheet, and they have to do their own content analysis. And almost all of them go, this journal does not represent who I think I am. This is kind of depressed and tired, but I'm actually this friendly. So they're not true. I once screamed at a grad student. It was the last day of the last class, and she said, we have learned so many true things. <laughs> they're not true. They're constructed. Anybody else have a question? Back to Emily. And her <laughs> Back to her Emily. Um, since uh, we also have a long-term diary of Emily's daughter, um, what, what do you think that <clears throat> that says about her parenting compared to how she thought of herself? That's that. Great question. Uh, I knew Emily's daughter's diary was here, and it was even longer. And when I began it, knowing that she was prestigious with the WCTU and teaching and started it and it was depressed, I went, I cannot spend another few years. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. Uh, and so I left that to my colleague, Suzanne Bunkers, from Mankato University. And uh, she found that uh, Sarah eventually was in a very abusive relationship with her brother. Her brother turned out probably to be the villain. In fact, I think because Emily constructed such perfect children that um, that was a case of Emily hiding, that it was actually this very, very mean brother. But she did create both of, of those children. But I'll give you an example of why a diary is not true. In Emily's diary, at one point late in life, she said, the preacher was here for dinner. He admired one of my paintings. That fired James Fury. He threw down his napkin and left. Now all will know what he is like. Sarah, the teenage daughter's diary. The minister was here for dinner. He admired one of mother's paintings. She said, oh, I could have been a great artist if I weren't trapped here on the farm. That fired Pa's fury. <laughs> <laughs> so you could tell many, many, many stories. And it wasn't until very late in life that Sarah broke with the mother's tale and said, it was, it's Henry. It was Henry who was brutal. Uh, Emily gave just a couple of hints of that, of Henry saying, my friends are coming. You can't look like that. You have to look better a few things like that. But I do think she did a number on Sarah. Henry never married and kept the farmhouse that I visited for life. And Sarah married a man older than her father after her mother had died. And he was very kind and very loving. And I think when she went back to Nebraska to bury him, is this, is this right, Mary, with his first wife, she discovered that he had also had a Native American wife. So we don't tell all the stories about our lives. I'm going to go home tonight in my diary and write how one of my favorite honor students is here, along with two of my favorite professors. This is fabulous. This is amazing. Let's give Judy another round of applause.